welcome back to our final session of Intro to Tech Skills. I'm kind of upset that it's going to be ending now, but I hope everyone has really enjoyed all these sessions. But don't go anywhere. This is our last session. It's going to be really awesome. Hey, but I just want to remind you, remember we spoke about a quiz before? I'm going to redirect you to the repo where you can fill out the form to claim your STAM passport. You can go ahead and do the AI gaming challenge. You can go ahead and also submit your Minecraft space and Cloud Skills Challenge. So it's going to be super awesome. Hey, what do we have next, Gwen, for the next session? Exactly. Up next, we have the New Developer's Guide to the Cloud. And it's going to be sort of your choose your own adventure to go from zero to cloud. I know this is going to be packed with a lot. Surprised they got to pack so much into one session. Uh, so you're going to be joining Microsoft Cloud Developer Advocates, Summerlees, Nitya, and Chris for this session. Wow. I'm super excited. And Let's get started. I'm going to pass it over to you, Chris. Thank you, Salman. Thank you, Gwen. All right. Uh, the New Developer's Guide. My name is Chris. With me, I got co-presenters Samalis and Nitya. You will hear both from Samalis and Nitya as we progress. New Developer's Guide. What is that thing, Chris? Well, in our agenda today, we'll cover things such as how to learn C Sharp and how to build apps with it. We'll also cover how to deploy C Sharp apps with uh, and have them deployed to Azure, of course. We will, from Nitya, we will learn a bunch about JavaScript and the fact that there is Node.js on the back end. You heard it from me and from everyone else. You can use JavaScript on the full stack. Also, we will look at a very interesting service here called Azure Static Apps. This is one of the fastest routes to get you to Azure. We will also finally look at how to learn Python. I know some of you today listening to this, you might be beginners, you might even be students, you might be used to reading and taking Python in university. This will take your skills further, I promise. So part of this is to learn how to use Python and also as a finishing demo, I will demo how to build a web API and then use an AI service that we call a cognitive service. And guess what? It will translate text into whatever language that we choose. So you want that pocket calculator created? That is how. There is a call out link here at the bottom right, new developers guide. This is where you will find all the links and the videos. You click that thing, you will find a PDF and hopefully that PDF will inspire you to keep on building. Right, so this is the guide. And how does all of this work, Chris? Well, first of all, as uh, Gwyn and Salman were saying, this is a choose your own adventure, meaning that we will uh, provide you with four different tech stacks. Choose one of them, choose the one that suits you. So go with JavaScript or C Sharp or Java or Python. So whatever you fancy, there's hopefully something for you. So how does this work guide work then? Well, we want to meet you where you are. So that means that we have developed a guide in a way. So you take your skills from language fundamentals, then you move on to those first language constructs to learn how to build an application. Thereafter, you take that application, you move it to the cloud, and once finally you're in the cloud, there are things that you need to think about, such as instrumentation, authentication, all of that to make your app grow up and work in an enterprise context. So yeah, lots of steps to ensure that we are take you all the way from zero to the cloud. Now uh, I will hand things over to Samalisi and he will explain everything about C Sharp and .NET uh, to see what you can build with it. Over to you, Samalisi. Thank you so much, Chris, um, for that amazing introduction. So obviously my job here is to actually introduce to you .NET and C Sharp. So this is more of a journey on what you can do with .NET and C Sharp in terms of what you can build and what are the best possibilities that you can actually find using .NET and C Sharp. So what do I really mean? And what do we have for today is that we want to show you what you can actually build with C Sharp and .NET, because obviously this is a journey like Gwen and someone actually mentioned, and then we will take you on how you can actually build your first C Sharp application. And probably it has something very exciting that you can build. 
over that is that we need to understand what is an API within building that C sharp application because obviously we want to make our application exciting. And then obviously understanding what is an API, we need to build and use that API as our next step. And then we'll also look at how to actually publish your application to the cloud as Chris actually obviously mentioned, because we also need to take our application from zero to the cloud. Then the next part will be building a web, a web API plus using Azure Cognitive Services to analyze text. Okay, I gave you the agenda. I gave you what we can do. So what exactly can I build with C-Sharp and .NET, Somaleze? So obviously you can build mobile applications using Xamarin and Maui. You can move over and actually build desktop apps using Forms or WPF, which is something I learned when I was still in university. Or you can actually build web applications because you want your own e-commerce site or you just want your own static web application because you want to seem really cool. And you can also build APIs and microservices, which is a nod to our agenda, obviously. Then you can also build console applications, which are something that I actually looked at when I was still a university student. That's where I began my journey. And then obviously you can build so much more using C Sharp and .NET. So that is amazing, right? That's an amazing journey. How do we start this journey? Obviously, we start off this journey by using one of our learn modules where you can be able to write your first C sharp code. Why am I mentioning this? The reason is because this learn module actually has one biggest benefit. What's this benefit? Obviously, in the past, when I was trying to learn C sharp, I needed to download Visual Studio on my PC, and my PC was not really powerful at the time. So with this learn module, you would be able to actually write your own code using the code editor that is embedded in the browser using that learn module. Okay, we've established what you can actually do at first. You need those basics. What's your next step? The next step is to actually build an API, but before you can do that, you need to understand what is an API. So first, the formal definition of API is application programming interfaces where they allow us to share important data and expose practical business functionality between devices and applications and individuals. So I have this one specific um, example, which is what we can apply in our real life um, situation. Take for an instant, you go to a restaurant and you go to that restaurant, you see all these tables, chairs, and everyone uh, is there. So what happens in a restaurant is that you have chefs, you have waiters, and you have the tables that you see as the client. When you get there, you just order and your food is delivered to you or is received by you. What happens is that in between that, you have those waiters and waitresses that are taking your orders, taking it back to the kitchen, to the chef, and the chef cooks that 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 food and then takes it back to you. That is how I would like for you to actually think and actually apply your knowledge about what is an API. So we have a minimal API module within Microsoft Learn that you can be able to build your own API with just writing five lines of code. Really, that's very awesome if you can ask me. So once you've built your application, embedded in it a web API or minimal web API by just writing five lines of code. What's your next step? Obviously, our session today is to take you from zero to the cloud. So you need to host your web application using the Azure App Service, which allows you to deploy your application to Azure so that it can be available to be used by everyone and anyone that is around you that you intend your application to use. So our next step is for me to actually show you how you can actually build your own web API. So what do I mean by that? You can look at our demo right now and we'll just see how it actually works. So we start off our demo with a class that will act as our database. 
This database will be a local database so that we can be able to access our data and will help us see our API in action. So you've already heard about the definition about the API and you've seen it in action applied in the real life world. So how do we go about creating an API using c -sharp and .NET? On the main program class, you would then need to add this using statement where you would say using microsoft.openapi.models and then for you to be able to create your own API, you would need to instantiate a builder. So this builder would then proceed to allow you to be able to create endpoints for your minimal web API. Then the next part is that you would need to add a swagger file. So this swagger file or swagger doc for your API allows you or allows your minimal API to self-document as you go on along with the routes that you are going to add on your API. What am I talking about when we speak about routes? So if you see on the screen here, we have all these four different, five different lines of code from line 22 to line 26. Those are our uh, routings. So those routings serve as our action methods or our HTTP post get and put methods where we'll be able to manipulate the data as we see fit. Either we want to get the information or we want to post the information or we want to update information on our local database. Of course, to use our local database, we also need to, um, to use the using statement here so that we can be able to access our local database, which is the pizza store.db class. So you wonder what's next. Once you have this few lines of code, because in the past you would need chuck loads of code to create an API. Once you have these lines of code, you can then proceed to run your application. To run our application now, the one cool thing about .NET is that you are able to run your application using the command line or the CMD that you have on your PC and you can run your application with just one command which is .NET run. Then the next step after that when you've used this command it will then build your project or build your application and then will initialize it or listen for it on a local host. Obviously, we are running our application on a local host. So for an example, it then provides us with a link, a local link where we'll be able to access our application so that we can see whether our open API or our minimal API works. So we'll, this link that you see here is our local host. So when we head over to our browser and paste this link, and try to run our application, it will just say hello world. And it's a black screen and it has nothing to do with our API. How do we access our API? I want you to remember we have a swagger file that is self-documenting our API. And again, our API is a bridge between our application and our data or our localized data. So how do we access the API, we can just say forward slash or backward slash for that letter. And then you say swagger. This way you'll be able to see your open API or your minimal API. In my case, it's this pizza store. So obviously you see that we have our API as a pizza store. As you see, on the screen, obviously, you have all these different methods, get, delete, post, and put. Remember that scenario that I just gave you a few minutes ago, which is the waiters and waitresses. Take these methods as our waiters and waitresses where they will be able to retrieve specific information either by one specific pizza or all specific pizzas or we can be able to edit that information or add new pieces onto our code or onto our database using this 
one minimal API that we just wrote five lines of code to actually be able to access and use within our application. Now, I didn't really mean to make anyone hungry by talking about pizzas and restaurants, but that was one of the most plausible and real life scenarios that I could actually give you about a web API. So next up is that I will just give it back to Chris so that we can hear more about Node.js and JavaScript. Take it away, Chris. Thank you, Samalisi. And uh, you definitely made me hungry with that pizza. I should say, though, I was talking about uh, cakes earlier, so I'm no better when it comes to tempting people. Right. So uh, next up, we are talking about Node.js and JavaScript. So just a quick reminder, when we say Node.js, what we say is JavaScript on the back end. Uh, yeah, so I'm actually going to hand this one over to Nitya to explain. Nitya, what can we build with things JavaScript? Hi, Chris. Thank you so much. What can we build with JavaScript? The real question is, what can't we build with JavaScript? So why JavaScript? JavaScript is one of the most popular languages today. In fact, if you've got a JavaScript project with a front-end framework or a full-stack framework on your resume, that's a really marketable skill to have. You know what? Why do I need to do slides when we can build web apps, right? Let's actually look at this in action. I'm going to switch over and see if I can show you a demo that also happens to be my slides. Hope you're all set, yeah? So if you want to follow along, you can go find the link. Uh, they might paste it on the chat, or you can find it on Twitter. I'll share it later. But this is a hosted app. It's a web app that's running in the cloud. It's what your portfolio could look like. And you look at the top and you'll see that it says Azure Static Web Apps, right? So keep that in mind. So what are we gonna talk about today? You got this, I assure you. What's the plan? Our plan today is to start with a few learning objectives. By the end of this session, I will be, if I did my job well, you should be able to tell me what is React, what is Node.js, what are Azure Static Web Apps, what are Azure Functions, what is Azure Cosmos DB, and how do I put all these together to build something like this website, right? So let's start with that simple question. What can I build with JS? I'm really glad we started with .NET C Sharp because we already got a sense of what you can build. But here's the thing with JavaScript. JavaScript, you run it because it's executed by a JavaScript engine. And I don't know if you know this, but historically, the JavaScript engine was built for the browser, which is why when you think JavaScript, you're thinking web apps, right? Node.js is a runtime that takes the JavaScript engine out of the browser. What does that mean for you? It means you can write JavaScript apps to have them run anywhere where Node.js runtime is supported. That's server side on the server, so you can write backend services, or you can even write them for the desktop because Node.js will run there. And I'll throw you one bonus. Did you know that there are technologies like Apache Cordova? where you can write your code in JavaScript and will cross compile it for native platforms like Android and iOS and um, Windows. So yeah, you can write mobile apps, you can write desktop apps, you can write web apps, you can write server side apps, you can write anything with JavaScript. For each one of these slides, at the bottom, I'll actually try to provide some resources that you can use. So you're probably asking yourself, what should I learn? Like That's a lot, right? Here's a really structured way, and we brought this up in the beginning. When you think of a developer journey into the cloud, it's, a, it's an iterative process. So start with the fundamentals. First, learn a language. Hopefully, you know JavaScript already. Then learn a front-end framework. Hugely recommend React. It's one of the most popular frameworks, and as you'll see at the bottom in the resources section, it kind of keeps sitting at the top of the votes every year when they look at rising stars. Next, learn a back-end framework. If React lets you build your front-end UIs and user experience, the backend framework, usually with a Node.js uh, runtime, is going to let you build backend services. If you just learn these three, now you have the tools in your hand and you can start building apps. Now you're ready to step into the cloud. First, you've got this app. You need to have people use it, just like I'm letting you use this now. You need to host it. That's where Azure Static Web Apps comes in. Great, you've got your app hosted, but you know, you probably want people to be interacting with it. You're gathering data. You want things to change based on what people are doing. That means you need a backend service where you can send requests, get responses, and be interactive. Do this with Azure Functions. We're talking. About, we're going to talk about why it's serverless and why that matters, not just to your performance, but to your budget. Last but not least, all of this means there's data. So you need a cloud services like Cosmos DB that'll bring you a database. So let's go look at 
a nice use case. I told you what you're looking at right now is an example of a portfolio, like the one that you're on. But then I also have another example for you, which is a resume. What if you were able to build your resume, host it in the cloud and do interesting things with cloud services? And that literally becomes your showcase project and the CV that you sent to your prospective employer. Wouldn't that be cool? So if you're interested, I actually started scaffolding a project here that I hope you'll all try out later. You can go ahead and link in there and what you'll see is it's a GitHub repo. You can go find it um, by clicking on that link. And I have in the readme the complete tutorial of how you build this. So you can just go step by step and build this out yourself. What does it look like right now? It's hosted on Azure Static Web Apps. And this is what it looks like. What we're going to do uh, as we step through this is figure out what we can do with uh, different cloud services to build what I just showed you. First, we're going to learn React, right? Why React? React is a front end framework, but it's actually a declarative UI that allows you to build applications using components. Why components? When you build your basic, if you're familiar with JavaScript, uh, HTML, and CSS, you're probably building your web app by writing HTML and you're kind of stamping out different sections. So in a resume, maybe I have five projects, I have 10 skills, I have 20 talks, right? So I'm writing this out again and again, right? With components, you define a template for what that looks like, and then you say, I have 10 instances of data that need to fill it in. And then all that the, the framework does is go stamp, 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 and you've got your 10 elements. It's more efficient. That's what React can help you do. This is what that looks like. I'm actually going to show you a little bit of magic for a second. If you are following along and you went to this uh, GitHub repo of mine that has the source, go ahead and press just the dot on that page. It'll open it up in a GitHub editor. And so you should be able to see the source right there in VS Code. Try it out. So when we're looking at this, we're looking at the source for this particular app. And I'm going to have you look at two things. You'll see there's an index.js file and an app.js file. Index.js is the application component, the starting point for your React app and app.js is the core component that we'll be using. I actually kind of put that code in here just to make it readable and annotated them so you know what it's doing. What does that index.js file do? It imports a whole bunch of components that assembles your app, and then it kind of looks in the index HTML, you know, the root page that's shown in the website and says, I'm looking for an element called root. Right now there's nothing in it, but what I'm gonna do, please React, can you go ahead and take this component, this brilliant component I built called app, and render it under that element. And suddenly this empty page is filled out with your resume. What does that app do? This is what that app component looks like. The one I'm showing you is what happens when you scaffold your first React app using Create React. And so what you'll see if you follow the tutorial is something like this. So what this app component is doing is really generating the view, the UI element that you see on the screen. You'll notice something interesting, right? This is supposed to be JavaScript, but wait, I'm seeing a, a lot of markup. What is this? This is because one thing you should know about React is it uses a, a syntax called JSX. I joke that it means it's JavaScript that's just a little bit extra, but what it really means is it's JavaScript that can handle XML syntax embedded in it. But the brilliance of it is it allows you to mix the structure, you know, the element, what it looks like, and its behavior, which is the JavaScript, in one file. So you've got a self-contained component. Anytime you want to debug it, maintain it, you know where to go to see what's happening. You'll also notice little things like this syntax. You know, it looks like handlebars around that. And this logo you'll see up there is imported from somewhere else. So in other words, within this view, you can actually um, tell, like run JavaScript to figure out what, uh, evaluate an expression and bind it into the UI. So this is really, really cool, right? Let's say you went ahead you use the scaffold and you built this. You kind of tested it out on your local machine. And again, the, the, the tutorial will tell you how to do that. Now you want everyone to see it. This is where Static Web Apps comes in. So let's talk about what Static Web Apps is. Static Web Apps is a service in Azure that does a really interesting architecture for your full stack apps. It thinks of your app as static assets, your HTML, JavaScript, CSS, images, anything that doesn't change over time on one side, and then functions or serverless API endpoints. In other words, there is the static stuff that doesn't change. And then based on what the user does, you want to go to the server with the request responses and then adapt to, the, to it, right? It treats them separately. The content is distributed with content distribution servers, so it'll scale beautifully and it'll be really cheap. 
the API, it uses Azure Functions. We'll talk about that later. But the most important thing for you right now, the thing that you need to know is Azure Functions hosts the, I mean, sorry, Azure Static Web Apps hosts your app for you and sets up the GitHub Actions workflow so you never have to worry about automating build deploy again. Let's see that in action. Remember I had this uh, app already set up. So let's go back and do something interesting. I'm gonna just go in here. Remember, this is the, the repo, right? I'm just gonna go in here and for whatever reason, I saw that Ada Lovelace, according to this, lives in Seattle. And I'm like, she doesn't live in Seattle. I don't know what you're talking about. So we're gonna go ahead and change that to United Kingdom. You know what, let's make sure she lived in New York because that's where I'm from. And I think she absolutely deserves to be here, right? I made a change. I'm just going to go in and commit the change, right? Now, this hasn't changed. I'm going to reload it. The app doesn't look like it's changed. It still says Seattle. But look at what's happening on our back end. I mean, look at what's happening in our repo. Because Static Web Apps set up this workflow for us, the minute I just committed a change, it's off and running. It's doing my work for me. I love it when other people do my work for me. We're going to come back and check on this later when this build job is done to see whether the update was made. But that is the beauty of static web apps. You All you have to do is configure the action, use VS Code, there's a new CLI, smooth as butter. I'm running out of time, so I'm going to hop to the next thing and then talk a bit about a couple of things you can do that will build on this project. We talked about static web apps. Let's talk about functions. Remember that resume? You've got it hosted, but all the data is hard-coded in one file. I want to be able to hit an API and say, give me all my publications, give me all my skills, get the data, and then bind it. As some of these have pointed out, that's what APIs are for. Static Web Apps makes it super easy for you to integrate Azure Functions. What are Azure Functions? They set up an API endpoint that looks something like this. You remember he talked about routes, methods, triggers? So here is the route. It's telling, in this particular case, you're saying, I accept this function will wake up every time there's an HTTP request and it's a GET request. That means I'm only reading it. And it allows me to add authentication saying, hey, this is for this particular route and only certain people are allowed to use it. What does that function look like? It's just JavaScript. Given a request, it lets you process the request whichever way you want and return a response. That's it. With this, you should be able to build a very simple API that's integrated with Azure Functions. There is a tutorial for this, and there's a project I'll talk about if I get a minute that shows you how to do that. I'm going to wrap up quickly because we're running out of time. We talked about this right now for your front end. There are two other things you need to know. Back end, all this stuff, what you've got right now should give you a really beautiful resume with an API, do whatever you want. But now your friends started saying, I want one too. And you realize I have to make all these apps, but I can't give, keep, keep putting my data and managing so many APIs. So you decide you're going to build a resume service. Node will help you do that. With Node, you can have frameworks like Express. Here's what a very simple Express app looks like. You start it up, give it a port, set up your routes, and then you run it. It listens on the port every time there's a request on that particular thing. So here is the root. It goes ahead and sends a response. Seems familiar, right? So now you can take the stuff you're doing with Azure Functions and move it over to the back end and reuse it across multiple apps. Last but not least, that's a lot of data and you need to store it somewhere. There is a service for that. That's Cosmos DB. And there is a module that will tell you how to use that Node.js app to talk to Cosmos DB on the back end. That's all I had. You made it. I have two last things. Let's see if our, yes, it deployed. So right now, because of you, Ada Loveless lives in New York. Thank you so much. And I'll give you three project ideas in here that you can go look at, try out. Uh, you can build a resume, you can build a portfolio, or you can build a code site. Instructions are in there. Last but not least, shout out to Hello um, 30 Days of SWA. If you're interested in static web apps, just go click on the link at the top over here. It'll take you to the site, and this one has tons and tons of content to help you walk systematically through everything static web apps. And I think with that, I'm done, Chris. Are we now saying uh, JavaScript is the best? I am sure impressed by all the things JavaScript could do in that short of a time as well. So resume sites, and we also saw the minimal API from Somalis, right? So I think it's uh, the uh, flavor of the month, right? Five lines of code to build an API. If it takes more, what am I even doing, right? Okay.
let me just get back to the last section of this guide, which is about Python. With Python, it's a general purpose language. It's very competent. It's able to build many different things. So you can use Python for web development. You can use it for scripting, for Internet of Things, also known as IoT, meaning uh, toasters, any kind of measuring device, anything really, right? Could be your vacuum cleaner. And also within machine learning and data science, and we will uh, showcase some of that as well. Uh, and yeah, so Python, very competent, just like JavaScript can run anywhere. And I believe that is true for C Sharp and .NET as well. There is a huge Python learning path as part of AKA MS Learn. Uh, what's in there for you is 12 parts, 12 modules that's going to keep you busy for hours, teaching you things such as Boolean types, strings, dictionaries, working with notebooks, uh, managing projects, and much, much more. I promise you, if you have no knowledge of Python coming in there, you will sure come out very competent. Now, uh, one of the things that you will learn while being there is about a concept called notebooks, what they are and how they can help you code and document at the same time. You might have seen what Anitya was using, the uh, Docusaurus platform for showcasing text and code at the same time. That is exactly what you will be getting with notebooks as well and the ability to run the code as you learn. Uh, same thing as Somalis, uh, by the way, mentioned as well with C Sharp. So, we're all about this integrated experience for you to type and learn at the same time while using Microsoft Learn. Uh, other things you will learn is how to write programs in Python, uh, various Python core elements, and as I said before, how to manage projects and dependencies as things are getting more complicated. This is what the learning experience will look like. Here on your right, what you're seeing first is a text element on the top explaining what's about to happen. Then you have this code element uh, with some code and you are expected to type code inside of that element and hit the play button. Once you do that, the underlying engine will compile and run this code. And if you for some reason uh, will get stuck, then there's this code at the bottom showing you the solution. So don't worry, we have your back. Now, uh, here's a simple algorithm uh, uh, written in Python. Uh, what it's showing you is parsec. This is a term used in, in space traveling. This is a very uh, far distance. Light years, some of you might have heard about. You can convert between the two by multiplying parsecs with this constant 3.26. And what we're doing at the end here is to print out the results. Uh, print expects everything to be the same data type. It expects it to be a string. So we're also calling this str function that converts our number into a string so everything plays nicely. Otherwise, Python would uh, uh, complain and say, hey, what are you even doing here, Chris? Why are you trying to mix data types? But yeah, so that's what uh, some starter code can look like that is doing a bunch of good already. Now, uh, the, this is the demo for this section of the presentation, but I will ease you into it slowly. There is a learn module that all of this is built upon. It is called build an AI web app using Python and Flask. Now, AI stands for artificial intelligence. We have a bunch of services on Azure uh, helping you to do various AIs. You don't need to be a machine learning or data science specialist to use one. All you need to know how to do is to call a web request. Uh, we will also use a framework called Flask, which is very similar to uh, Express that Nitya was using and also the minimal API. Remember how we talked about five lines of code to get an API? Same thing here with Flask. Just quickly, some Flask code so you understand what's going on. Uh, on your right, you see some Python code. One of the first thing it does is to import Flask as a library so you get all of those nice functionalities. What's happening next is that it's defining a route. Uh, by defining a route, the user will be able to navigate to that subpart of the address, and you are writing some response code to do something. What you're doing here under the index method is that you are rendering back a template pointing towards index HTML. This might make sense for you if you want to showcase a user interface to the user, so they're able to interact with it by typing in text field, pressing a button, and so on. This is what the full code looks like for this entire demo. 
Don't worry if this looks intimidating and a lot of code. I'll take you through each of these steps. One thing I want to put, uh, point your attention to is the top line, which says app route to default route uh, slash. But this time, instead of get, it's saying post. And we use the post when we have a, an intention to create something or do some kind of submission of data. So that's exactly what we're doing by this app decorate uh, thing. We are defining this index post method and it's doing a bunch of good things for us. The first thing it is doing is to receive the response from a form in a web UI. It is digging out the values text and language that's been submitted to it. So those will be used to do a translation of a text from one language to another. Then we are constructing a URL because our AI service lives somewhere on Azure. So we need to construct a URL that looks a bit different depending on where you have deployed it in the world. We also need to make sure that the endpoint is, is pointing correctly. One thing that we do need to talk to Azure is to authenticate ourselves. So here we're setting a bunch of headers, including a unique header, uh, the subscription key, which you will get as you provision the AI resource. This is uniquely to say that you are you. So all you need to do is to go to portalazure.com to copy that and paste that as part of the header. Uh, so in fact, what we're doing here, if you look a few lines up, is that we are looking for some environment keys when we call it os.environ. So this is from a, a environment file where we can paste these um, secrets. I will show you that as part of the code demo. Moving on, we are making the actual request here. So we're taking that URL, we're taking those headers that authenticate us towards Azure, and we are making the request. What's happening after that is that request is coming back to us. We need to translate into a format that we can read, meaning that we call a JSON method. Once we have that JSON data, we start digging out those values from the JSON response, and we try to populate a page that we are about to render. So the very last line to happen in this part of the code is to render a template to results.html. We are taking our translated text, because that's what Azure is giving us back. We are taking our original text so we can compare, and we are taking the original language that we selected from a dropdown. We send all of that into results.html. To show you all how this works, there is a demo I would like to show you. So let's start that demo. Here we are inside the Visual Studio Code. First off, we are looking at app.py. This is our application file. Then we're looking at requirements.txt. This is where we define the libraries that we need to build things. Flask is very important. .env, we're using that to handle our environment variables, and we used requests to make requests. This is the starter file, the index.html. Results.html, we will render this as a response when, once we've done that request towards Azure. That's about the templates. If we're looking inside our virtual environment, this is a thing that isolates us from uh, the rest of our machine. Because when we start installing libraries, we want to make sure that we are in a unique spot because different uh, projects, they need different versions of different libraries. So uh, being inside of this uh, virtual environment is a thing that we want to be in. Well, it, it's a thing we want to use when we build projects. Looking into lib, these are all the libraries. These are way more than three libraries. And this is because all of these libraries that we specified in requirements txt, they had sub libraries. Those are not things that you need to worry about, but this is something it will uh, need to resolve when you hit pip install to install all of these dependencies. So uh, now let's try to explain some code here. First off, we have Flask, uh, uh, which we are importing. Once we import Flask, then we load our environment variables. What are those? If we click .env file, we will see what .env contains. These are values that we got from Azure Portal. This is our unique API key, our endpoint, and our location. All of these three is something that Azure will need from us, so that request will happen correctly. This will uniquely identify us and say, hey, Chris, I know it's you. I will allow this request to go on. We're all good. And uh, yeah, what happens after that is on line eight here, where we define the uh, app route slash and the get. We will just move this code a little bit because there is a space here on uh, line nine that shouldn't be there. We're gonna jump in there. Now we will return our first UI index HTML. This is the starter page that will face the user. 
Um, so yeah, this is uh, an HTML page uh, containing a text area, a drop down, and a button. Uh, the best thing we can do at this point to explain the flow of the application is to start it from the console. So let's uh, jump into the console. The way to run the application is by hitting flask run, if I remember correctly. Whoops, and uh, let's type this correctly. Right, okay, so now we're at localhost 5000. This is where our API is running. We're hitting that. As you can see, there's a UI for the user to interact with. Let's try to translate things, right? So what we can do here is to select a language, a target language. Let's go with, uh, I think German is a good language, right? Uh, before we select the language, let's just type something in. So let's type something in in English that we know what it is. Um, I'm saying this, uh, hello in German, right? Some of you might, might speak German, and back comes a translation from Azure, hello of Deutsch. This is great, right? I can use this application as I go on vacation to Germany. Uh, there is a, another uh, language here that we could be using from this drop list, so I think I'm going to go with Italian. I have yet to visit Rome, so, you know, but if I use this app, Maybe I can actually learn some Italian before I go. So let's do hello in Italian as well. And you can see how that works. And we get ciao in Italiano. This is super. I'm packing my bags to Berlin. I'm packing my bags to Rome. And that's what we wanted to show at, uh, as part of this demo. I've in a slide already explained what happens as part of this index host method. Uh, we are nearing the end of our presentation, and hopefully today you realize you haven't learned any languages, but I hope from all of us that you feel inspired, because that was our goal today. We want to inspire you with C Sharp, with JavaScript, with Python, and just see that the possibilities are really, really endless. As soon as you learn that language, there's so many frameworks out there that will let you do amazing things in five lines of code. And if you use 10 lines of code, you will have learned React if, if we talk to Nitya about it, right? And I'm sure some of these would say the same thing with C Sharp and say, hey kids, go build a Unity game or maybe use .NET MAUI that was just uh, released uh, publicly uh, on build. So yes, C Sharp, JavaScript, Python. Also in the guide is Java. We haven't mentioned that today because we only had yay much time. I want to thank you all uh for tuning in and listening to this last presentation in this segment we are very very grateful for everyone who tuned in today and hopefully you will be inspired to either go buy pizza if you listen a little bit more to somalis or if you listen some to nitya i'm sure you will all want that smashing looking resume i know i want that piece and i will also take that translation app with me and i will go into a booking site and book my trips just this minute. Somalis, uh, do you want to say something to our audience before we leave off? Yes, this has been a wonderful opportunity to actually just share about how we can actually use a real life experience of the restaurant and build a web API. And on top of that, we didn't stop from there. We saw all of these methods that I spoke about being applied within Python and Node.js. So I'm really grateful to have come here and actually shared all of this information with you guys. And I hope you actually are inspired and you're going to learn more. Nitya, what about you? Oh, my message is really simple. I want you to go build this stuff. So hashtag intro to tech skills. I'm at Nitya on Twitter. I want to see you publish your resume. So if you have anything that you're working on and you need help, come reach out. We'd love to see what projects you come up with. JavaScript is the best. Thank you. Whoa, I'm Fantastic. so excited. Thank you so much. This was such an amazing session. And oh, unfortunately, this is, well, it's not the end with Intro to Tech Skills since you can find all the resources on the GitHub. But unfortunately, it's the end for me and Gwen. And um, yeah, what do you have to say, Gwen? It's been an absolute pleasure being your host for all these Intro to Tech Skills sessions here. Don't forget that your journey does not end. It just begun. There are so many resources in that GitHub repo. Speakers, thank you so much. It was a pleasure having you be the last session. Hopefully, we'll be back hosting this next year. Hint, hint, team. Yeah, <laughs> anyway, <laughs> check out the GitHub repo. And there's still plenty more Microsoft Build to check out, so don't forget about that. That's it from us. We love you. Bye.